see. Um, can folks hear me fine? Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Zahan. I'm an engineer. At, I've been an engineer at Meta for over a decade. And I'm here to tell you about how we launched the Threads app uh, last year. There was a plan for me to speak last year, but the schedule's in the range, but I'm glad I'm here now. Let's, talk about, let's start by talking about the opportunity that presented itself. It was January last year, <laughs> and I had just returned to work after a couple of months on leave. I was looking for something to work on, and the tech scene was buzzing about Elon's business decision since he took Twitter private in November. We were talking about it at Meta as well. For reference, back in 2019, Mark had made the call that public conversations were not the focus and pivoted both Facebook and Instagram to focus on private communication between friends instead. The analogies were the public town square and the living room. Mark's view was that communication in the living room was going to grow more over the next decade. That left Twitter as the de facto forum to debate ideas in public, a function so important I think we all can agree to society. Since Elon took over at Twitter, he made a number of controversial decisions, to put it lightly. Um, popular opinion was that it was just a matter of time before the site had an extended outage, depriving millions of their favorite place online. It was increasingly obvious that there was an opportunity opening up here. The world clearly valued a service like Twitter, and the primary value in a social network is the people in it, not the product. As many people abandoned Twitter, they were looking for somewhere else to hang out. At first, we thought that maybe the differentiating feature here is the text format. So we made it easier to make text posts on our existing products. In Instagram, some double-digit percentage of posts have some form of text on them. So we figured, what if it were easy to make posts that had nothing but text in it? How would that fare? It didn't get much usage. Few use the format because while Instagram and Twitter share mechanical similarities, like a directed follow graph and a feed that's based on interests, each product has its own culture, its own raison d'etre that's set early in the product life cycle. Whilst Twitter was the public town square, Instagram was where you caught up with your friends' lives or where you are entertained by short form videos. We realized that to build a competing product, we really would have to build a new product with a new set of norms. The main concern we had, starting from scratch, was that how long this could potentially take. We were acutely aware that we had a fleeting window of opportunity to capitalize on here that could disappear as quickly as it appeared. People still love Twitter as a brand, though little did I know his plans for the brand. Still in our view, time to market was all that mattered, and we enshrined that in everything we did. Every shortcut was on the table, every bit of scope up for debate, every, source, every complication or source of concern. The ask was that we needed to be prepared to ship at very short notice. So let's focus on exactly what we wanted to build. We started by laying out the basic values of this product. We had four. First, the format here was text. Every post needed to start with text. Instagram put media front and center, but not here. Two, we wanted to carry over the design language and ethos of Instagram. The simplicity, the feel of the product that so many love around the world. We felt like that was a good foundation. Three, we knew that one of the values that helped early Twitter establish itself was its openness. By this, I mean that the community was free to craft their own experience with an API, public content was widely available on the web through embeds, and people generally used the, these tools to share their Twitter feed all over the place. While this is a new world, with Gen AI coming up, we felt like a new wall garden product just wouldn't fly. We were paying attention to Mastodon, the Fediverse, and interoperable social networks. And I'll talk more about that later. Lastly, we felt like we needed to prioritize the needs of creators. Every social network has a class of folks who produce the majority of the content that others consume. This usually follows a Zipfian sort of exponential distribution. On text-based networks, this is exaggerated, and it's a smaller proportion of the user base who produce most of the content. It's kind of hard to be interesting and funny in 500 characters. So we knew that keeping the needs of this community in mind was critical for long-term success. With these values in mind, we sketched out what the absolute bare minimum product was and get, got to work building. To give ourselves goalposts, we outlined four milestones we'd like to get to. An important objective was that we wanted to have a product ready to ship as soon as possible to give us options. 
So each milestone was designed to be a possible end state itself, where we could ship if needed. Each one gradually layered on the next most essential bit of functionality. Milestone one was just about standing up the app. You can see how bare bones that is. Being able to log in to make a text post that gets associated with your account, really just the basics. Milestone two was our essentials bucket, giving the app its familiar look with tabs for feed, notifications, and profile, getting the basics of integrity work in, being able to block another profile to report it. <coughs> Milestone three was what we call the lean launch candidate. Here we fleshed out services that have been neglected before, like a basic people search, a full screen media viewer to view photos and videos, starting to figure out what to do with conversations, the lifeblood of the app. How do you rank them as a unit? Uh, copying your follow graph from IG so that you can bootstrap your profile and the ability to mute other profiles, that's a long laundry list. Milestone four was where we in enabled interoperability with the Fediverse and was our final ship candidate. For anyone who knows the product, you might be laughing at the ambitiousness because we are far from full Fediverse interop even today. But in one of my weaker moments, I promised we could have this ready within the month. So this was gonna be the last thing we tackled in May. <clears throat> we took this very seriously. As each milestone neared, we shifted from a building features mindset to a polish for launch mindset. This was honestly exhausting as an engineer, as the context switching between building modes is taxing, and in some ways we shipped pre three products in those six months. Each time we'd call a war room, burn the midnight oil, and push through to get a complete app. Then we'd decide whether we were ready or not to ship. With the benefit of hindsight, I now see there was a big upside to this strategy. It served as a strong forcing function to simplify the product. If all you get is three weeks to pick what you, features you will add and which will add the most incremental value, you really have to boil it down to just the basics. The actual product we shipped was something like M3.5. We never got anywhere near M4, but we did get a much needed iteration on top of M3. Now, all of this would be extremely ambitious to build from scratch in five months. Sorry, one second. We started in earnest in Feb, and we were promising our leadership that we'd have it ready by the summer. But we had a trick up our sleeves, and that was that we had no intention of building this from scratch. When you take a wide angle view, broadcast sharing on Instagram is fairly straightforward. You can follow profiles, access a feed of their posts, plus some recommendations, and you can respond to one another, building up, a con a building up communities around interests. Coincidentally, this is exactly the set of features we wanted for threads on day one. So we did it. We took the biggest shortcut ever and reused Instagram wholesale. For the back end, it literally just is the Instagram back end with some custom functionality for threads. And for the apps, we forked the Instagram app code base on each platform. Starting from Instagram meant that we started with a fully featured product and had to strip it down to just the functionality needed. The screen recording shows what I mean. Our first prototype added a mode to the Instagram feed that surfaced text only posts. We, use, we, we reuse the ranking, and for the post, the inside joke is that we just reordered the layout. We put the caption on top and the media on the bottom. Everything else is just the same. This drastically reduced technical scope. We've now taken the intractable problem of how do you build a new text-based social network and turned it into a very specific one. How do I customize Instagram feed to display a new text post format? As engineers, you will undoubtedly note that this approach has major downsides. You're accumulating massive tech debt using a code base for something new that it wasn't designed to serve. There's a whole series of paper cuts that you accumulate as a result. You'll also, you also need to know said legacy code base inside and out. It's millions of lines of code, but you need to customize just a few so that you can effectively repurpose it. My favorite one-liner about this is that it's harder to read someone else's code than it is to write your own. With, that, with this, you're losing your one chance to start over clean. But this approach helped us stay focused on the product and keep this experience simple. A user could onboard by just logging in with Instagram. We borrowed Instagram's design language. Your Instagram identity bootstrapped your threads one. We carry the spirit throughout, surgically reusing what we could and rebuilding only where necessary. It also means that the threads team has much to be grateful for 
the existing of existence of Threads itself owes itself to the foundation laid by Instagram infra and product teams over the years. We'd be nowhere without it. <clears throat> I like to think that this focus on simplicity paid off. Much of the praise we received at launch was for the Spartan simplicity of the app, without it feeling like it has lacked essential features. Now to dive into a couple of areas with interesting implications. One technique we used to tune the experience quickly was to make iteration in the product itself very easy. The client, in a traditional client server model, oh sorry, we did this using server driven UI. In a traditional client server model, the client is responsible for everything about how the data is laid out on screen. The server is just middleware pulling data out from stores. What we did was for the core interfaces which showed a list of posts, we instead sent down a full view model which told the client exactly how to render it. This meant that when we were experimenting on the call to action in the reply bar or when and how we show different reply face files, we could do that with just a code change on the server which only takes a couple of hours to roll out and takes effect on all platforms. This let us iterate on the core threading UI very, early in the, uh, very quickly in the early days. Another big focus was making this space feel safe and welcoming for all. We'd seen public social networks before and many turn into angry spaces where people just don't hear each other out. Of course, the jury's still out on what degree threads can live up to this aspiration, but I think there's a few factors that are important. First, there's the product culture set from the early days by those who are the seed of your network. A lot of our early users were experienced in this, and so you, lot ha you saw a lot of call-outs like block early and often, don't engage with rage bait, don't use quote posts to dunk on people. Then there's the tooling that helps people maintain control over their experience. For instance, it starts with the ability to block, of course, but there's variations on this for different circumstances, like restrict, which ensures that the other party doesn't know you took action, and mute, which hides their content from your feed. There's the popular hide reply functionality, which gives you some small control over the conversation that your post generates. Lastly, there's moderation. It's tricky to get right, but there's no doubt in my mind that robust moderation is essential. To make a space acceptable to a mainstream audience, you need to do something about the extremes of speech. There's just too much breadth in what one can find on the open internet. I'll go as far as to say that for a new social network today, that is the unique value you're providing. In many ways, moderation is the product people are subscribing to. Luckily, we brought a decade of experience from, with this from Facebook and Instagram here. And while I'm sure it needs further tuning to feel right, at least we started from a good starting point. Combined with features and culture, all these help set healthy new norms. The last focus I want to touch on is creating a buzz for the product before launch. An example of this is the golden ticket Easter egg we had hidden and which, which we had made and hidden in Instagram. You might call this holographic effect over-engineered, but it looked beautiful and felt playful, which sparked interest. We had little hidden entry points, specific keyword searches, hashtags, and long presses to let people know that something was launching soon and let them sign up for a reminder. Moreover, we had a small early access launch for journalists and creators who had shown an interest. It ended up being just a day or so, but it gave them a chance to learn and see what this new platform was like. And it didn't hurt that when they shared their impressions with their audience, the curiosity grew. Okay, if you're tired of fuzzy stories, this is when we get to the more technical part of the talk. To understand the launch, I need to give you a quick technical overview of the thread stack. Meta in general is big into monolithic binaries and its monorepo. There's a number of reasons for this, better covered in other talks, but the upshot is that much of Instagram's business logic lives in a Python binary called distillery, which talks to Meta's bigger monolith, a massive PHP binary or hack binary called www. Distillery is probably the largest Django deployment in the world, something I don't know if we're proud of, even if we run a pretty custom version of it. <clears throat> the data for our users is stored in a variety of systems, but the most important ones are tau, a write-through cache that operates on a graph data model, 
and UDB is a sharded MySQL deployment that stores almost all our data. By graph data model, I mean that DAO is natively familiar with links between nodes and has optimized operations to query details of those. There's indexing systems on top that let you annotate particular links with how you want to query them, and they build in memory indices to help. The whole model has evolved over many years of building social products as Meta, and this has served us well. There's also other systems involved, and I can't do them all justice. There's a big Haskell service that fronts a lot of the rules that go into our decision making around restrictions, like looking for inauthentic behavior and user actions. There's a key value store called ZippyDB that's used to stash lots of transient data that's written too often for MySQL to handle the load. Um, there's a serverless compute platform, async, which was critical and I'll cover it later. And then there's a Kubernetes-like system for managing, deploying, and scaling all these services. All of these need to work in concert. So that's the background into which you insert our little product going live in July of last year. The story is that we were planning for a mid-July launch. When news started doing the rounds, the Twitter planned to restrict consumption of tweets for free users. This started a significant news cycle and we saw opportunity. So we decided to launch a week early, even though it meant foregoing some load testing and final prep work. The launch was set for July 6th and we opened up the Easter eggs I mentioned to generate buzz and we started our early access program. On July 5th, anyone who wasn't an engineer was happily hanging out on the product with the celebs who had come on for early access. This was the, probably the closest anyone was gonna get to a personal chat with Shakira. But for engineers, it was an all hands on deck preparation for launch the next day. Upsizing systems, sketching out the run of show, and the like. And I've never forgiven my product manager for that. Then in the middle of the day, our data engineer popped up in the chat and mentioned something odd. He was seeing tens of thousands of failed login attempts on our app. This was odd because no one, certainly not tens of thousands of people, should have access to the app yet. We pivoted quickly and ruled out a data issue. Then we noticed that all of these were coming from East Asian countries. Maybe you figured it out. It would take us another beat to realize that this was time zones. Specifically, we were using the App Store's pre-order feature where people can sign up to download your app once it's available and you specify a date. Since we said July 6th, once it was past midnight in these countries, the app became available and they couldn't log in because of another gate on our end. This was an oh shit moment. And, <laughs> and the warm, fuzzy feeling of being safely ensconced in an internal only limited testing was gone. We pulled together a war room and a Zoom call with close to 100 experts from around the company and all the various systems I mentioned. Given that this was the middle of the night in those countries, it was evident that demand was gonna far exceed our estimations once this all went live. We had a healthy pre-order backlog built up and they were all gonna get the app once the clock struck midnight in their local time. We chose a new target launch time, specifically midnight UK time, which gave us a couple of hours to prepare. We spent that time upsizing all the systems the threads touched, and I fondly remember a particular ZippyDB cache that is essential for feed to function at all, um, that needed to be resharded. It had to be resharded to handle 100x the capacity it was provisioned for. That job ended minutes before Mark posted that Threads was open for signups. And I don't think I'll ever forget the stress of those final moments. <clears throat> the user growth in those first couple of days has been well covered elsewhere. So uh, apologies if this is a repeat. Broadly, a million people downloaded our app and onboarded to try it out in the first hour from when it went live. 10 million in the first day, 70 million in the first two days, and about 100 million in the first five days. After that, the novelty effects started to wear off and the buzziness subsided. But surviving those first five days was quite the feat. While people would later opine that it was great that Threads had a relatively smooth ride with no major visible downtime, it certainly didn't feel that way to me. We had a number of fires going at all times and I didn't sleep much that week. What kept us up was all the experts in the room, certainly not me who had the experience of dealing with larger user bases if not facing this kind of explosive growth. 
We tweaked the network enough to stay afloat, and we furiously fought the fires to keep things from spiraling. To pick a couple of interesting fires, the first is that we were consuming more capacity than one should. We were serving just a relatively small pool of posts to a smallish user base. This was most evident on our boss's timeline. We started getting reports that it was actually failing to load. The thing is that Mark had an order of magnitude more interactions with his posts than anyone else in that early network. More likes, replies, reposts, quote posts, you name it, Mark was at five digits when everyone else was at four. We finally root caused this to a particular database query that we needed to render every post, but the runtime scaled with the number of repos. It needed an index. And so with a couple of tries, we nailed the problematic query and the site got healthier. <clears throat> Another fire revolved around copying the follower graph from Instagram to threads. So when someone signs up for threads, we gave them the option to follow everyone that they already follow on Instagram on threads. That might sound daunting, but it's actually a limited operation. You have a maximum number of people you can follow in the single digit thousands. So that works fine, it's a limited operation. Our serverless compute platform soaked up the load, and I think at one point we had a backlog in the tens of millions in the job queue, uh, but with some handholding it worked just fine. Again, a testament to the wonderful engineering that's gone into these systems. The issue with graph copying was that you could also say that you wanted to follow people who hadn't signed up for threads yet. Maybe you can see the issue now because handling that person signing up is an unbounded operation. <clears throat> when a big celebrity, say former President Barack Obama, signed up for threads, they had a backlog in the millions of people who were waiting to follow them. And the system that we had originally designed simply couldn't handle that scale. So we raced to redesign that system to horizontally scale and orchestrate a bunch of workers so it could eat through these humongous queues um, for these sorts of accounts. We also tried to manually get through the backlog since this was a sensitive time for the product and we didn't want to leave potential engagement on the table. It was a hair-raising couple of days, but I love the design of the system we finally made and it's worked smoothly ever since. <clears throat> All told, I doubt I'll ever experience a product launch quite like that again, but I learned a bunch from others about staying graceful in stressful situations, and I'll carry that wherever I go. Past the launch, we needed to quickly pivot to address features that users were asking for. It had now been nine months, and in that time, we finally opened to Europe in this last December. We shipped a following feed, a feed you have full control over with content from people you follow, sorted chronologically. We got our web client out there, which caters to our power users. We have a limited release of an API that allows you to read and write posts. And we polished content search um, and started showing what conversations are trending on the network. We also have big questions that loom over us. What should play a more important role in ranking? The follow graph that people choose or understanding content and matching it with people's re revealed preferences? How do we cater to the needs of power users who've come over from Twitter who have very clear ideas about what they expect from the product, whilst also serving all the people who are new to a text-based public conversation app? <clears throat> One of the developments you might find more interesting is about the adoption of ActivityPub. This is an open protocol for interoperating between microblogging networks <coughs> and the accumulation of those networks is called the Fediverse. Keen-eyed listeners will note that I had promised Fediverse interop on an insanely ambitious timeline pre-launch, but thankfully that wasn't put to the test. Today, we're approaching Fediverse interop piece by piece, and we want to build it right instead of building it quickly. The reason is that we cannot integrate it into the legacy Instagram broadcast sharing stack. It has too many integration points with the rest of Meta, we want to make strong guarantees about how we process this imported data. So we essentially need to rewrite our business logic and backend stack, which is ongoing. <coughs> In conclusion, 
getting this off the ground was a unique experience for me. And my biggest takeaway is the power of keeping things simple. It's certainly not easy. The aphorism about it taking longer to write a shorter letter applies to anything creative. But if you're clear about the value you want to provide, it can guide all your hard decisions on where you want to cut scope. <coughs> the other learning is that cleaner, newer code isn't necessarily always better. All the little learnings encoded into an old battle-tested code base add up. So if you can help it, don't throw it away. <coughs> the complement to this is, saying, is our saying that code wins arguments. This is to say that building a product often answers questions better than an abstract analysis. We got through a lot of thorny questions quicker with prototypes instead of slide decks. <coughs> of course, nothing can be entirely generalized because we need to acknowledge how lucky we are for the opportunity and the reception once this product came out. None of that was guaranteed, and I feel very grateful for the community that embraced the product. We have a saying that goes back to the early days of Facebook, that this journey is just 1% finished. It indeed feels that way to me, especially with threads. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, what was the size and maturity of the engineering team put on this task? Yeah, I think we've talked about this in, in articles. Uh, I think as we started building, it was like a rolling stone. So we started with maybe five to 10 engineers um, in Jan. Uh, by the middle of it, we were up to 25, 30 engineers. By launch, we were up to maybe 30, 40 engineers on the core product team. Um, but again, standing on the shoulders of giants. This doesn't count all the pieces that we were able to reuse and, and sort of platform teams we could lean on, right, for different pieces. So I don't know, in, in, the, in the end, maybe it was more like 100 engineers who contributed in some way. But, um, and of course, we got to reuse all those bits of infra and stuff. But um, yeah, the core product team stayed under 50. Thank you. Sorry, can you talk a little bit about the testing? Like, how did sure. you ensure that it worked and you, yeah. like, don't kill yourself <laughs> yeah. with Instagram and everything, you know? We, we didn't get to test much, right, because of our timeline. <laughs> um, the, we lived on the product, of course. From the time that it was a standalone app and we could download it on our phones, we, we published all the time, we, we shared. Um, Instagram itself is a fairly big uh, organization, so they're like a couple of thousand people. <coughs> so for at least a couple of months, a couple of thousand people were using the app. Um, uh, we used it for all, it was all internal only content and we wiped it all before we went public. So uh, we, we got a fair amount of, of like ad hoc testing that way. We were not prepared for the scale, but that's again like what a lot of this talk is about is, is, is about handling that. Uh, and then we were able to react quickly and rely on these systems that have been built for the scale. Uh, but yeah, and, and, and I would say like uh, on the back end, we do have a pretty good test-driven development culture where we write a lot of integration tests uh, for, for APIs as we make them and stuff, uh, but there's no religiousness about it, so yeah. Thank you for, sure, for sharing everything. Um, you mentioned earlier that you were onboarding tech debt with old code. Yeah. What's uh, one year later? What happened to that? We're paying down that debt. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. So so reusing the code base meant that you're reusing it with all its edge case handling and all its warts, right? Uh, and sometimes it's difficult to know which uh, which context you're operating in. Are you serving an in Instagram function? Or are you serving a threads function? So uh, yeah, so we're, we have a big project underway to uh, disentangle that. 
So this is where being opportunistic was important. That opportunity was only going to last for that time. And so it, it's, it, I think uh, uh, Ranbir mentioned, like everything in architecture is a trade-off, right? And here the right trade-off definitely was to take on that tech debt and, and enable launching the product sooner. Uh, um, but, but now we have this like changing the engine of the plane while it's in flight sort of project um, to like rewrite it and tease things apart and stuff, but we're doing it, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. If I understood you correctly, you said you started out by forking the Instagram code. So are you planning on kind of reunifying that or do you want to uh, split it further apart? It's drifting apart over time. Uh, it's, it was a convenient starting point, but uh, the, <coughs> yeah, with, with, us in a, with us embedding more deeply with this sort of interoperable like activity pub support and things, uh, and just leaning into more of the uniqueness of what makes threads threads and what makes Instagram Instagram, uh, they're drifting apart over time and we have to tease that apart. Hello, thanks for the talk. I have two questions, if I may. Uh, for the first one, you mentioned reusing the uh, backend of Instagram. Mm -hmm. So how does, it say, the uh, data model and the APIs look for threads versus Instagram? Are you reusing the same data model with some fields or a new API for each operation? They're similar, but we're starting to tease them apart. So uh, we use the same. <coughs> Instagram had a custom REST API, by which is how the clients and, and servers spoke to each other. Uh, we started by reusing that, but we're moving towards adopting GraphQL more. So GraphQL is used by Facebook extensively, and with GraphQL you get to do a lot more granular sort of specification of what data the client needs and, and also like how you define that on the server. So uh, moving to that more sort of field-oriented model, and it's, it's this whole inverting the data model idea, right? So instead of business logic living on the server, uh, for compositing data together, the client just requests like specific pieces of data, uh, so we can we can label those things as being either threads only or Instagram only, and 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 tease it apart that way. Uh, but yeah, we started with Instagram, and now we're we're teasing it apart. Uh, one of the uh, differentiators you mentioned was that you could iterate quickly on the uh, UI from the mobile applications. Mm -hmm. um, at Uber, we specify, let's say, a generic card format that the uh, back end then was returning. Let's say, the, you know, put text first, then put the other stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there something similar in place here, or are you, let's say... It was a little more product-specific than that. It wasn't... So we have, we have frameworks to do that very generic stuff. So, like, specify, like, a shadow DOM, and that's your API, right? Um, and there's, like, server-side rendering stuff. Um, that was not what we were doing over here. This is more like a product specific, uh, um, this is the post you should put here, but like stuff that usually you would, you would do on the client, whether it's like figuring out what reply CTA to, do, to use, how to render the line, like is there a loop here, stuff like that. It was, it was like a custom data model, but it did let us iterate. We had, we had variations on how we render self threads, where you reply to yourself in a chain. Um, how do we how do we how do we show that we we tried a number of ideas and we were able to do this um, with our dog fooding community of a few thousand people um, on the fly quickly thanks to this but um, no we were not doing like a, a generic sort of server side rendering thing we we do use that in other places for some of the um, <coughs> for some of the onboarding things or like the Fediverse onboarding uses that sort of a um, a server-driven rendering thing, but that, that's not what this was. Hello. Hey. Yeah, I have a question. If you have to do it again, what would you do differently? Um, there are some, so I would, I would, so this reusing to move quicker was what saved our bacon. So I, I'm, I would do that but I would take a few architectural decisions differently where like specific data models that we reused, I would choose to um, spend a little time detangling them. Um, maybe it would push us back a month or something, uh, but it, uh, it would have been worth it because untangling it now is, is like very complicated. But uh, 
but no, the, the overall ethos of like reuse what you can, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't change that. Thank you. Coming back on the question rela relating to technical depth, like how, how are you unfolding that? Like how do you address that thing on a day-to-day -day basis? What does that look in the team planning and backlog? Like yeah, yeah, could be a talk of its own. Um, <coughs> so we have pretty mature frameworks for doing sort of data migrations on this scale because we've had to like split things out before in Meta, right? When you think of like splitting Messenger from Facebook or splitting uh, Marketplace out from Facebook or whatever, there are uh, a couple of examples of this. So we have frameworks, for instance, that tail all um, all mutations that happen on that. So that UDB that I talked about, right? That's our main data store on MySQL. So there are systems that tail those bin logs and like let you do things with that. So they're observers. Um, I'm sure they're open source equivalents of this, like tailing a Kafka queue or something. A anyway, um, so you, yeah, you you can write an observer that, that tails that and says, okay, double write this. And so now we have two, two versions of this particular data model, say the user model, um, and that we need to keep up to date. Um, then we start migrating the product logic over to start reading from both of those places. And depending on whether it's an Instagram context or a threads context, you now start reading from the new data model. Um, and then you start the, the doing the double reading and comparing consistency and stuff. Uh, there's a number of techniques like that. Part of the problem is um, it's quite a deep data model. So, so when you think about the post itself, the post itself can have a lot of things linked to it and all of those things recursively need to now either be threads data or Instagram data. And so we need to go in deep and, and, and do those annotations and stuff. Um, some, of, some of which can be done statically, some of which need to be done dynamically at runtime because it depends on who created it. So it's complicated, but um, um, still the right trade-off. Thank you for the talk. Um, when reusing the code, you're also potentially reusing the technical depth, which was originally in that code, and then you're ending up with multiple places uh, using the same mistakes or problems. Mm -hmm. So how do you see that? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, it's, it's, yeah, it's part of the tech debt we take on, but again, it was a trade-off, right? We could either take on that tech debt and build a product in six months, or we could start from scratch and probably take a year or something to have like a fully fully fledged product. Um, and we knew that we needed to take advantage of this, like this window. And so, um, yeah, we, we were okay with, with taking that on and pay, paying for it later. It's, it's, you're taking out a loan, right? And you're saying, I'm gonna pay interest later, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Hello, thank you for the talk. Hey. Oh, hey. Uh, I just have a question, so uh, to capitalize on a previous question. Uh, when you say that you first inherited the code from Instagram and now you are decoupling um, this code kind of. So in terms of uh, coding and backlog and stories that are being done by the developers, do you have like a certain allocation for this decoupling? For example, a certain team is working on removing the unneeded parts and just keeping what is needed in terms of code so that in the future the code is more maintainable and easier to read and everything that is needed is there without extra stuff? Absolutely, that's a, that's a good question because we have to balance needs now, right? On the one hand, we need to evolve the product because we haven't found product market fit at all, right? We're, we're, um, we're a brand new product. And on the other hand, we need to make this code base more maintainable and, and pay down some of the tech debt and sort of, um, <coughs> remove foot guns, right? Remove, remove things that can catch developers unaware and lead to, uh, lead to big outages. So, uh, so yeah, we need to balance that. Right now we're balancing that by having a separate team focus on, on this particular migration. 
but at some point it impacts all product developers and you can't, you can't get away from that. Uh, and, and so that will temporarily slow down sort of progress in building the, building the product and, and we're okay. we know that we're gonna have to pay that at some point. Um, but yeah, you, it, it's a tricky question to, it's a tricky thing of how to organizationally set this up. Um, but so far, uh, so far, yeah, it's been with like a separate team. Maybe, maybe a couple more questions. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, are there any development decisions you've made in the development of Threads um, that have then influenced things that have gone back into other code bases and applications at Meta? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, let me think. Well, I I hope the activity pub stuff makes it at some point. Um, that has not happened yet, but uh, I think that has a lot of promise. Uh, or, or generally sort of interoperating with other, with other networks. Um, certainly the lean nature of this uh, has been lauded within Meta. So um, the fact that we were able to do this with a small team, uh, Meta has a playbook of like building large teams around important, um, important uh, product, important goals. And so this was sort of a counterpoint example. Uh, and so that, that organizational lesson has, has definitely been taken, taken to heart. Um, I think on the technical side, there's a lot of interesting stuff we're doing with ranking that's new to Meta. So uh, other networks get to, with their ranking, the, the most important thing they're predicting is like how engage with, with obviously with, with checks and balances, but how engaging is this post gonna be, right? I'm gonna go look back and find the most interesting post and then sequence it by the next most interesting post and that's how you build up your feed. Um, with, with threads, uh, you need to pay attention to the real time nature of this product to a much greater degree. And so um, some of the luxury and slack you have in your ranking stack to like, um, from the time a post is made to the time it's eligible for ranking and the time it starts actively getting picked up, um, that latency window can be much bigger for something like Instagram than it needs to be. For threads, like from the moment you post, it should, it needs to be eligible like near real time because this is how news breaks, right? If there's an earthquake, you wanna know right now. If there's a helicopter flying overhead, you wanna know why. Uh, and so uh, that, 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 novel, that novelty in the ranking stack is something we've had to push on. Uh, and it's something Twitter does very well, for instance. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so organizationally with, yeah, sorry. Um, on the subject of technical debt, are we working with the Instagram teams that we sort of inherited this from and potentially could have a similar solution to? Is that probably it? Yeah. Um, yeah, so organizationally, we're still, Threads is still an, an, an Instagram team, is still a subsidiary, and so we're, we're, uh, we do work, work with those teams. In many cases, it was not like a straight fork as much as a, we're reusing the same code. So if we make, if we had a shared solution, it, 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 in, it improves in both places. Uh, <clears throat> Meta has this system called Better Engineering, which is about enabling, it's almost like a 20% time thing, which like similar to what Google used to have, uh, where we incentivize people to work on tech debt type problems um, in their spare time. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're folding it into that and, 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 and we're working with, the, with these teams. But um, <clears throat> the main sort of short term focus now is making the data models clear um, be between, these, between these apps. Yeah. Hello, oh sorry. Hi, you in the middle. Oh. <laughs> um, I have a question, like thinking about the, the products of Meta, was there a specific reason to, let's say, use the Instagram architecture yeah. rather than let's say Facebook yeah. or maybe something else? Good question. Um, I think it started from the fact that Instagram is a directed follow graph, right? As opposed to Facebook, which is bi-directional friends. Um, and that, that one decision has a lot of technical implications. Uh, Instagram, we probably could have 
started from somewhere else, but um, I think I think that plus the fact that the this is a bit of Conway's law, right? The the team who was building this was familiar with the Instagram tech stack, and so it made sort of sense to to repurpose that. But um, yeah, our options were Facebook and Instagram, and and Instagram seemed like a better fit. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering how many people were involved uh, initially in the project, um, boiled down to how many teams, and also how did you structure? I'm here. <laughs> in the oh, hi. Sorry. Uh, yeah. And um, how did you structure that uh, based on the fact that you were just like starting on a huge code, ba code base? Yeah, it was it was small. I think I answered a question. Like it's uh, it started out with ten-ish engineers, snowballed into like maybe fifty-ish by the end, but. Uh, the fact that we could lean on these platform teams made a lot of difference. And so like in the end, maybe like 100 engineers or so like touched something that made it into the Threads app. Uh, <coughs> um, but yeah, it, 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 we, we kept it small deliberately. We, we, we didn't want, A, we wanted to stay a nimble team and we wanted to pivot like the product itself that we were making and we wanted to keep the product simple. And B, um, yeah, we were certainly worried about leak risks and stuff. Yeah, sure. Let's do the last question. Hello. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so you touched on uh, the ranking system over here. Uh, here. Sorry. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so you did you? You said you did some ranking stuff. I'm curious if you had issues with bots and uh, if you're taking steps in the security area. Yeah. Good question. Uh, yes, bots are a problem. Um, Again, very lucky that we can sort of rely on a long history of sort of teams fighting bots on Instagram and, and Facebook as well. Uh, but they do show up in unique ways on, on threads. And so we have had problems where it's gotten out to users, right? Uh, I don't know if any of you use threads, but you might have, sometimes you get spammy replies and stuff like that, which, which we're fighting hard. Uh, yeah, you, this is, Integrity is very much like a firefighting domain where you have to see what patterns, like these are adversaries who continually evolve their patterns, right? But so you learn one pattern, you put in a mitigation against it, and then they shift to a different pattern, right? Different abuse pattern. So uh, it's, it's like, uh, it's taxing, but it is something that we know how to do, and we have teams, teams who do this well. So, so um, I'd say like among the more interesting novel challenges we have here is um, threads to a much greater degree than Instagram or Facebook is about linking out to the web. Um, uh, in Facebook and Instagram can be more sort of cyclically, uh, can be more internally referenced, but not as much sort of outbound links. Um, and so we have a number of sort of challenges there we have to figure out about awareness of what's going on in the web, redirects and, and, and link crawlers and that sort of fun stuff. But uh, yeah, it's hard. Let's give Thank another you. round of applause for Zahan. Thank you. <laughs>